All right, so we are starting a brand new series today called But Now God, and this comes from a scripture in Romans chapter three. For those of you just jumping on, we, we started going through Romans uh, about a couple months ago. And uh, if you know anything about the book of Romans, you know it's gonna take us a while to go through the book of Romans. In fact, I was, I was joking around, I, I shaved, and many of you have noticed that. Um, I, I don't like to shave very often. I shave like once a year. I just hit the reset button once a year. And the reason I don't like it is because I look young. And I got really tired years ago being the pastor and introducing myself to people and them saying, oh, are you the pastor? And I'd say yes. And they would go like, the main, like, the main one? You know, because I just, I look like a kid when I don't, when I don't have a beard. And so I'm going to grow it back. But I thought this, this is actually kind of an interesting idea. Now that we're doing everything with video, what if, what if I shave at the start of every series? And then I just grow the beard out until the series is done. And that's how you can visually know where we're at in the series. You're like, oh, we're early on in the series right now because, you know, clean shaven. And then you know that we're about done when the beard comes in a little bit more full. Uh, the problem is if we did that with Romans, that would, that's it's gonna take a while. I would have a, a very, I'd have an interesting beard. Let's just say that. Uh, but maybe we'll do it with the, I'm teasing, we're not gonna do it at all. It's just a joke. But now God, this comes from Romans chapter three, verse 21. I'm gonna get to that in just a second. When we started Romans, we got through uh, verse 17 of chapter one. And so for the next several weeks, we're gonna cover a lot of ground, a lot of ground scripturally. And what Romans chapter one, verse 18, all the way to verse 21 in chapter three really helps us understand as people is this concept of the wrath of God. The wrath of God, which you know is everyone's favorite thing to talk about. That's one of the reasons, by the way, I love going through scripture. Because when we go through scripture, when we commit ourselves to actually studying what scripture says, we're not, we're not picking and choosing what we're gonna study. When we go through scripture, we don't have the ability to, to dance around some of the more difficult conversations. We don't have the ability to kind of create a slalom course where we avoid anything that's challenging. I want us to have a mature faith. And I want you as a Jesus follower to have a mature faith, meaning that there's never a time that you open up the Bible and you have like a panic attack because you can't handle what, what it's talking about because you have no concept for it. I want us to grow and mature into people who can understand and appreciate the nuances of our faith. God is, is powerful and amazing and he's complex. He's complex. God has, has nuance to his character. Very often we wanna paint God in broad strokes. Very often we wanna, we wanna oversimplify who God is. And when we do that, we, we always get it wrong because God is incredibly nuanced. Yes, he's full of grace and love. And at the same time, he's a God of justice. And he's a God who makes sure that, that evil does not go unchecked. And so this, this section of Romans chapter one, verse 18, all the way through chapter three, verse 21, it, it kind of forces us to come to terms with that idea that we have this loving, gracious God who at the same time is just, and he is opposed to evil. And therefore he has what scripture calls wrath. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and read Romans one. I'm gonna start in, in verse 18 and, uh, and, just so you know, normally we're reading out of the New Living Translation, but for this series, we're gonna to switch to the English Standard Version. There's a lot of great translations of scripture. The New Living Translation does a really good job of putting what, what scripture is communicating in its original language into kind of common modern language. But sometimes when we do that, we miss some, there's some certain words that are changed that make sense to us, but it doesn't fully communicate what it was actually saying. And so the English Standard Version, I think is a better fit for this series. And this is what Romans 1 verse 18 says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, many of you are, are like, uh, you have the Bible app or you have some subscription that you get like a verse a day and every day you get an email or something or a notification that has a, a Bible verse. And usually those Bible verses are like, yeah, I needed that today. I very much doubt Romans chapter one, verse 18 is gonna pop up on any of those apps because let's read it again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, the wrath of God. Romans chapter one, verse 18, all the way, you know, halfway through chapter three, almost at the end of chapter three, deals with this idea of the wrath of God. And this is something we have a difficult time with as modern Jesus followers in America. We do not have a difficult time discussing God's love. We talk about that at length, but we have a difficult time discussing coming to terms with this idea of, of God's wrath, this idea that he has, he has wrath. Now, I want us to be really clear about something. God is love. That is his nature. God is, is not a God who is vengeful and vindictive, and every once in a while he gets in a loving mood. 
It's not the way it is at all. No, God's state of being is love. He is love. God is not anger. In fact, that's one of the main reasons I wanna use the English standard version and not the New Living because the New Living version of this verse says God's anger. Interestingly, in the original language, Paul talks a lot about the wrath of God, but he never once describes God as angry. And we're gonna get into this in, in a little bit more detail here in just a few minutes. But the idea here is that God is love but his anger can be provoked. He, he, can, he can have wrath for certain situations, even certain people or even whole groups of people. He can develop wrath for those people if they're, if they're acting in a way that is truly unjust and evil. God is opposed to evil. We have to understand that. God is opposed to evil. He is just. But we in our kind of modern Christian American world have a really hard time with that, which is why, by the way, anytime a pastor uh, maybe mentions hell, or judgment. It's almost like you have to hit the pause button and and do a whole hell message or a whole message on judgment. Like, just so you know, I don't want anyone to think that that God is really, it's like there's this need to have to hit the pause button and and talk about this because we're so consumed by, wait a minute, what does this mean? I thought God was love, but I want us to understand something. Scripture, there's no need to do that when we read this, when we read scripture. For example, Jesus, John chapter three, verses 16 through 21. If you know John chapter three, and by the way, I'm reading right off the His Hands mobile app if you want to follow along. John chapter three, 16 through 21. This is like one of the most important conversations that's ever happened in the history of our world. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he's really laying out for Nicodemus the gospel, the truth about who he is. It's really, really powerful. And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is Jesus talking. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that's a a scripture that if you're a Jesus follower, you probably know. God loves the world so much that he gave his only son. And then it goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, but let his works, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Okay, so what we have here is Jesus talking. And what we recognize is that he's able to talk about God's love for the world very, very freely. And then literally in the next breath, he's talking about these ideas of judgment. And and for Jesus, this isn't some type of, hey, I've got to stop and pause and just make sure that you guys are okay talking about this. For Jesus, it just kind of flows together. Jesus was completely comfortable understanding that God is insanely loving, that he is love and that everything he does is out of love. But at the same time, he's a God of justice and he opposes evil. It's very important that we understand this. And so what we're going to do today before we really get into the nuts and bolts of this section of Romans that we're gonna spend the next few weeks studying is I want us to have a conversation on why we struggle with this idea of, of God's wrath. And so today's message is it's kind of different. It's really a primer, a primer on understanding the wrath of God. Why as believers, and maybe this isn't true of you personally, maybe you're like, no, I'm fine with the idea that God is love, but also he opposes evil. I'm great with that. But for a lot of people, This is a real struggle. And if you look nationally at the church, it's a massive struggle. There's tons of research you can study and tons of stuff you can look into, surveys that are done. A lot of of Christians have a really hard time with this idea. And I want us to discuss why, because if we can't figure out why we struggle with this and we can't get over some of those holdups, we're gonna have a really hard time seeing what this is really all about. Because trust me, this is all going to an amazing place. Everything that we're talking about, this whole idea of God's wrath, it's all going to an amazing, incredible place because this whole but now God, this but now, this is in, this is in response to this idea of God's wrath and judgment. In fact, I'll go ahead and, and spoil it for you. Romans chapter three, verse 21, says it very clearly. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And you're like, okay, what is that? Well, that's, that's English standard version. So if we were reading this in the New Living, like more modern language, it would say this, but now God, now God has made a way for us to be made right with him without having to follow every single religious rule that we see in scripture. Now God has made a way for us to be made right with him. And so you have Romans 1.18 that says the, the, the wrath of God is being revealed. 
And then by the time we get to Romans 3.21, it says, now the righteousness of God is being freely given to us. That's this beautiful good news is yes, God has wrath and yes, he opposes evil. And yes, sometimes for us, that, that means looking in the mirror and realizing, oh no, I've got some stuff I got to work out. But now God, independent of everything you've ever done, independent of your worthiness or your unworthiness, now God has made a way for all of us to be made right. And it's through accepting Jesus. It's through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus said in John 3, whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. This is a God thing. This isn't us earning it. This isn't us doing like some incredible thing to finally earn the love of God. No, no, no. God has wrath and God opposes evil. And many of the things that that we deal with and do can be categorized as evil. And yet God, he's given us a way out. That is the beautiful good news. Everything that we're talking about for the next five weeks or so, it's all leading us to this idea, but now God. So all that said, I want us to to spend a few minutes really looking at why we get so held up and caught up in this whole idea of wrath, okay? And I I really, I wanna focus on four pretty simple things. And I'm gonna gonna write, so you're just gonna have to uh, forgive my handwriting, I'm a lefty. Um, Why do we struggle with, with wrath? Why do we need a primer on coming to terms with the idea that God has wrath? I think there's four main reasons, okay? Number one, there we go, number one. It's inconvenient. And I'm even gonna, I'm gonna put a slash here. It's inconvenient slash scary. Come on. All right. Again, sorry for the handwriting. Uh, Number one, it's inconvenient slash scary. Okay, so if God has wrath, that's kind of a scary thought, right? Because what if that, what if that wrath gets directed at me? What if I do something and, and what, hey, I know my heart. I know my mind. I know some of the thoughts that I've had. I know some of the things that I've done. And man, if God has wrath, does that mean his wrath is directed toward me? That's a scary thing to think through. Or, or it's maybe not scary to us, but it's inconvenient because maybe the person we're thinking about is not, is not us. Maybe the person we're thinking about is, is someone we love someone we really care about, someone who, who we know does not have faith in Jesus. And we go, well, what about them? If, if God has wrath and if Jesus is the only, the only way out of that, which by the way is very clearly what scripture says. As we're gonna go through Romans 1 and, and Romans 2, you're gonna see that, that the wrath of God is being revealed, but now there's, there's a way to escape that. There's a way to have salvation from that. And that, that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. And so if this is true, it means that we actually have to think about people that we may know and love that do not have faith in Jesus. And we have to come to terms with the inconvenience of that. Does that mean that maybe we need to talk to them, that we need to share our faith with them? And the answer probably is is yes, it, it does. If you truly care about them, if you love them, of course. It's so much, it's so much nicer just to, to imagine that, that no, no, God has no wrath at all, it, none whatsoever. And, and so no one has to, to worry about a thing. That, that is a nice thought but it's not biblical. Now you will find people who will try to pick scripture out from here and there and take this scripture here, this scripture there, this scripture here, and they'll, they'll try to paint that picture for you. Uh, but that's not a responsible way to, to read and interpret scripture. Not at all. For example, if, if you were at a restaurant and, uh, and you, only, you only chose like two of the things on the menu out of the entire menu, you wouldn't really have a sense for what what that restaurant really does, right? You've only tasted a few of the the items on the menu. You'd really have to sample everything to have an understanding for how good the restaurant is. The same is true in scripture. I know it's not a perfect analogy, but but we can't just take one verse here, one verse there and create a theology on it. We We have to look at everything in context. We have to look at everything that scripture says, the whole of scripture, and we've got to look at all of it through the person of Jesus. Now, here's the beautiful thing. We know that God's desire is for his wrath to be completely and totally dealt with, his justice to be completely and totally satisfied via Jesus' death on the cross. That's the good news. That God did pour out whatever wrath he has, that, that was poured out on the cross. It has been dealt with, provided that we have, have put ourselves under the cross, that we have, we've accepted what Jesus has done. Scripture is very clear on that. But a lot of people don't, don't like that. It's not, that's not uh, exciting enough news for them. They, they've got to twist it and, and, and make it, no, no, even simpler, that there is no such thing as God's wrath. That, and here's the simple truth. Great filter that I, I heard a pastor say years ago. Um, if I handed you a Bible and you read it and you believed it, would you come to this conclusion? If I handed you a New Testament, 
We'll just talk about the New Testament. If I handed you the New Testament and you read it and, and you just soaked it up and you shut the book and at the very end, I said, hey, what do you think? You, you, you'd be blown away. You'd have a lot of ideas. If I said, oh, so isn't it cool how like, everything's good no matter what and no one has anything at all that they have to worry about whatsoever and no one has to really even reckon you know, their spirit with you. Like, it's just, isn't it awesome that every, everything's just great no matter what? And you would, no, no, there, there's like, there's a beautiful love that God has and there's, there's this way that he's created for us to be made right with him, but we have to follow Jesus. So clearly we have to follow Jesus. And Jesus is clear on that. Scripture's clear on that. So we've got to get over the fact that it's kind of an inconvenient truth. And it might force us to, to have action that we have to take. It might force us to have to have conversations that might be uncomfortable conversations. It might force us to look, to look in the mirror and say, Lord, help me, help me to, to continue growing and being more like you so that I can help lead people to you. So number one, it's inconvenient, it's scary. Uh, number two, I'm gonna put, we think in human terms. There we go. We think in human terms. I was having a conversation with, uh, with a friend of mine this last week, kind of getting ready for this, conver- this conversation. And it's funny because we kept saying like, why do we struggle with this? And, and he said, I think it's because we think that God, and then he paused and he's like, I, I think it's because we think that, that, that sometimes, no, it's like we think, and I, I had to hit the pause button and go, I think you've nailed it. I think the problem is we think. We think in, in human terms. And God is not like us. Scripture, again, very clear on this. Isaiah chapter 55 says that, that you know, God is not like us, that his thoughts are not like us. His ways are above our ways. We think in human terms. And so what does that mean when it comes to God's wrath? When we think of God's wrath, we think about the wrath that we see in this world. We think like that. We see uh, wrath like, like humans have. And when you think about wrath from a human perspective, what it really means is that uh, someone's out of control, that someone's going way overboard, Right, you know, I think of like a night. I got like some bug flying around me. Um, I think of like the 19, 1980s, 1990s movies of like some uh, Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and someone wrongs them, and, and so they're like on a quest for vengeance, and everyone in their way is in a lot of trouble, and, and they go way overboard, way over the top. That's kind of how we think of wrath. And so, because we think in human terms, we then take this idea that we have of wrath and we apply it to God, but that's not how God's wrath is at all. God's wrath is never out of control. God's wrath is never too much. It's never over the top. God's wrath is always measured. It is, it is always patient. It is always the exact appropriate response to what's happening. Now, it takes some faith for us to understand that, but, but it's true. In fact, a great example of this would be if you read Genesis chapter 15, God is talking to, to Abraham. And he's talking about this group of people who occupy the land that Abraham's descendants will one day occupy. And they're the Amorites. And God tells Abraham in Genesis 15, 16, he says, the sin of the Amorites has not yet risen to the level of their destruction. And spoiler alert, if you you go a few books into the Bible further, the Amorites do end up getting destroyed. And if you read Leviticus chapter, uh, like chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18, which is a really fun read, by the way, uh, it's this laundry list of all like the, the things that God does not want his people to do. And most of the behaviors that God is describing, you're like, yeah, that's, de- that's detestable, that's sickening. And then in Leviticus 18, it says that these are the very things that the people who occupied this land before you did. What I'm trying to say is this, any rational human being would have looked at the Amorite culture of Abraham's day and said, that has to go because the things that they did were atrocious. We're talking like child sacrifice, human sacrifice, that kind of stuff. And yet God said it hasn't yet risen to the level of their destruction. Clearly God is more patient than we would be. Sometimes we like to think that, that, and we'll get into this in just a second. We we like to think that if we were God, we would be more patient. We would be more more loving. We read things in the Bible that God does. We're like, oh God, I don't, I think you kind of, I think you kind of lost yourself there for a second, But, but understand this. No, 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 God is God. And when he, when he exercises wrath, when he makes a judgment call, he's always right. And it's never over the top and it's never out of control. It's always the exact right response to the situation. Jesus, I think would be the perfect example. We're, we're all probably familiar. Many of us are familiar with the story of Jesus in the temple where he sees that people are being taken advantage of and the people running the temple are using it as a way to extort money from people basically. And so he walks in And typically we think of the story, and if you know the story I'm about to talk about, like Jesus looks around and he's just filled with rage and just immediately starts flipping tables over. 
That's not actually what happens. Uh, Jesus sees what's happening and then he walks away. And he actually says he braids a whip, which takes time. And then he comes back into the temple and he chases out all the money changers. Uh, That's the term they had for those people. He chases them out of the temple. He flips their tables over. But it wasn't Jesus just losing his temper. It was was very controlled. It was very intentional. It was measured. And I think when we all read that story, we go, yeah, Jesus, that's awesome. That's the exact right response. None of us read that and go, Jesus, you shouldn't have flipped over those tables. We recognize that there's a, a righteous justice. And Jesus lived with it. And so when Jesus does things like that, we go, yeah, right on Jesus. Now as people, our filters aren't as strong. So sometimes when we we flip tables over, it's because we're throwing a tantrum. I've got four kids, they understand that. But when Jesus flips a table, when Jesus, when God exercises wrath, it's always the exact right response. So we have to understand, we think in human terms, but but God's wrath is not what human wrath is. Okay, let's keep going. These next two are actually... They're very convicting. And I really want to encourage you and challenge you to stay with it. This is really important stuff. This helps us have a mature faith. Um, but this is convicting. All right, here's, here's the third reason. And this is a hard one. We have a tendency to judge God. I mentioned this just a second ago. Uh, that we oftentimes think, man, if I were God, I, I, I would have done it a little differently. If I were God, I, I wouldn't have been so angry right there. If I were God, I would, have, I would have held off. Stories like the flood in the Old Testament, whatever. We think if I were God, I would have done it in some other way. Um, that's actually us judging God. Now, I'm not saying you can't question God. Clearly you can. Many of the Psalms, many scriptures, even Jesus praying in the garden before he's arrested, it's okay to go, God, is, is this really what you want? Is this really the right way? Much of the Old Testament prophets were, were looking at what was happening around them and going, God, is this really what, what's supposed to happen? Is this, is this the right way? But we have to be very careful. There's a fine line between asking God with the spirit of humility saying, God, I'm open to you. Like, show me, show me what, what's happening because I'm confused. It doesn't seem like what's happening is, is what should happen. So open my eyes and help me understand. That's very different than saying, God, you got it wrong. C.S. Lewis wrote a really interesting essay called God in the Dock, or it might be God on the Dock. I don't know if it's in or on. When we think of a dock, we think of like fishing, right? A boat that's docked. But in C.S. Lewis's world, he's talking about, uh, again, this is England years and years and years ago. The dock would be like the docket, uh, a place where in court you would, you would have to be on a witness stand. Maybe you're being judged. And so that's where you're gonna sit. And so his point was, was what we often do is we put God in or on the dock, whichever, whichever one is right. And we put ourselves in a place of judgment over God. Now, very often when we do that, we actually deem God to be worthy. We go, hey God, I've, I've examined the things that you've said and done. I had some pretty interesting challenges to it, but you know, God, after careful examination, I have determined that you're good. And that's, that's fine. But, but what C.S. Lewis says is, no, no, no. Even, even the idea that we could do that shows a complete lack of understanding of who God actually is in comparison to us. That, that God is, is holy and he is righteous and he is completely and totally above us and he is sovereign. He is totally sovereign. And so this idea of, of us having the audacity to say, God, you've got some, you've got some explaining to do. And uh, Lord, so long as, as you answer these questions right, or, or you know, if I really think about it, I'm, I'm gonna determine whether or not you're right for me. Like, that's not how it works. What's, that's what C.S. Lewis said. That's not how it works. We don't, we don't judge God. He's over everything. See, guys, God is sovereign. And if you're gonna understand this idea of wrath and have a mature faith, you've gotta understand the idea of sovereignty. God is sovereign. He has the right to do whatever he, he chooses to do because he's over everything. On Friday night, we had this, this canvas event and uh, uh, I was thinking about it in terms of Marlon's paintings. You know, was, we have a lot of Marlon's paintings in the building that have kind of like become a logo for us over the years. And, uh, and you know, if, if you walked through the building and you saw me painting over one of Marlon's paintings, you would probably be appalled. Like, how, how dare you? How dare you? Like, you? You can't do that. You don't have the right to do that. But if you walk through our building and Marlon was painting over one of his paintings to, to do something brand new, you might be like, Marlon, that's, I love that painting. Why are you painting over it? And he might tell you, oh, I, don't, I don't like it. I don't think it's right. And you would go, that's crazy. I, I thought it was awesome. But you would recognize that Marlon is the artist, absolutely has the right to paint over his painting and, and to start again. In fact, one of my favorite paintings of, that Marlon's ever done, it's a painting uh, we have here at the building of this little tree. It's a little red tree. And it has a really unique texture. And I, I talked to Marlon about it once. And he's like, oh, that's because there's probably five paintings under that. 
He's like, yeah, I had five paintings and they just, they weren't right. And so I painted over it and started again, painted over it and started again. And by the time he got to that painting, it created this really cool like depth. And so we have to understand that, that God is sovereign. God, God does have the right to sort of paint over it and start again if that's what he chooses to do. God is sovereign over everything and we have to be really careful. It's okay to question God. It's okay to ask God questions with a, with a humility and a spirit that says, Lord, help me, help me see where I'm missing it. But it's a very different thing to judge God. And often we have a hard time with God's wrath because we judge him and we've deemed him to be too harsh when in reality, he's not. One final thing, one final thing. I know we're, we're covering a lot of ground today, but I only wanted to have one primer to, to understanding the wrath of God. This one, again, very, very personally challenging, but, but hear me out. We tolerate sin. You know, that's an I. <laughs> we tolerate sin. This thing's harder to use than it looks. We tolerate sin. God does not. And here's what I mean by that. We, we have, something has to be pretty bad for us to describe it as, as evil, right? Like think about the number of things that you would describe as, as evil. It's probably a pretty small list. And the things that are on that list that you would say that is evil, they, they, they are horrific things. We're probably talking about murder or really, really intense, intense sins. But then underneath that, there's a lot of stuff, this huge category for most of us as people that is like, I wouldn't call it, <coughs> excuse me, I wouldn't call it evil, we might say. I wouldn't say it's evil, it's just not good. You know, it's not, it's not evil, it's just, it's just not as good as it, as it could be, but we wouldn't describe those things as, as evil. Well, God's, God's a little bit more clear because if something isn't good, if it isn't right, it's 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 wrong. There's, there's not like this, this huge array of, of middle ground for God. And so God is okay with calling things evil when they're evil. Great example of this would be like idolatry. Okay, so idolatry is placing anything above God. If there's anything in the world that is more important to me than God, and last week we even talked about that with politics, right? Uh, if there's any political candidate person or, or a, a person whose podcast I listen to, <clears throat> excuse me, and their, their words matter to me a little bit more than Jesus, so what they say rises to the same level in my heart. It moves me the same way as Jesus. That's, that's like borderline idolatry. Idolatry is placing anything above God. But, but we wouldn't really call it idolatry. That just seems too harsh to us, right? So we might look at someone and say, man, I think you need to re-examine your priorities. We might say, hey, I, I, think, I think you've got your priorities a little out of whack, but we wouldn't look at that person and say, hey, you, you're, you're dealing with idolatry. I'm like, whoa, that's a little harsh, you know? But God doesn't have that hold up. And so we might say, you know, I think I need to reexamine my priorities. And God might look at us and say, you, you gotta deal with your idolatry. And he's not doing it to be a jerk. He's not doing it to be overly harsh. He just tells us the truth. See, the reality is we, we tolerate a lot of sin. Now there are certain things we don't tolerate, but there's this huge laundry list of things that, that we're like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. And so we might look at something, a great example that a, a pastor named Tim Mackey Who's a, who's a really great teacher, uh, he used, uh, he said that we would obviously all look and say something as, as horrific as child pornography, that, that child human trafficking, that is evil. That is absolute evil and God is opposed to it. And, and he will stand against that with a passionate fervor. And we'd be like, yes, I agree with that. But what we fail to realize is that God is, is not tolerant of lust, that God is not okay with, with someone lusting after someone else, that God is, is not someone, you know, it's one of those hard gut checks with the human heart that, you know, a lot of times we hear something that might be, uh, might be a little bit inappropriate. Um, you know, maybe it's a joke, maybe it's some crass kind of, kind of thing and we kind of smile a little bit. There's part of us that's like, you know, God, God doesn't do that because he has no, no place in his heart for sin. Scripture says that God is light and in him there's, there's no darkness at all. He's light, in him there is no darkness whatsoever. And so what I mean by that is, is this, God, God, he's opposed to sin. He's opposed to all evil. And that's where his wrath comes into play. Yes, he, he opposes it. He will deal with it. That's why scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, that one day I will make every wrong right. Now we might think about this in our, our own lives and go, oh no, does that mean I'm in trouble? <clears throat> does that mean that, that I have some serious you know, thinking to do, but I wanna go back to this, this statement as we wrap up. <clears throat> all of that, all of that is true, but now God, and hear this, but now God has made a way for us to be made right. Now God has made a way for us to be made right with him. 
Yes, it is true that God has wrath. And yes, it is true that that's inconvenient. And yes, it's true that, that, that God is over everything and he has the right He has the absolute right to make whatever judgment call that he makes. And yes, it's true that we all fall short. Romans 3, 23, we all fall short of God's standard. Yes, it's true that he will will deal with sin in its fullness. Yes, it's true that God opposes everything that is evil and those who do evil, they have have some some things to, to deal with when it comes to God because he will not let those things slide. All of that is true. And all of that, if you're a rational person, should lead you to almost a state of terror. That's why scripture says it's, it's kind of a, a terrifying thing to, to fall into the hands of the living God because he's holy. And all of that would bring us to absolute terror. What do we do? We would come undone if not for this statement, but now God has created a way for us to be made right with him through Jesus. And so yes, you've fallen short of God's standard. Yes, you have sin. Yes, there's evil that has taken place in your heart. Absolutely. The same is true for me and all of that is true and and God's righteousness and justice is true. And that's like a collision that is bound to happen except for the fact that now God through Jesus has saved all of us who put our faith in him. And now because I can give my life to Jesus, now because I can come and submit myself and say, thank you, Jesus, I put my faith in you through no action or effort of my own, I am saved. It's not, but now me by doing enough good things have been made right with God. It says, no, but now God, through sending Jesus to die on the cross for us, to be the the entire, scripture uses the word propitiation, to be the satisfaction of that that justice that is due. Through that action, we have all been given the opportunity to be completely and totally saved and free of any fear of God's wrath. That is good news. We started this whole conversation of Romans talking about good news. That is good news. And if it's not, I don't know what is. A friend of mine asked me this week, what's the appropriate response to this? Because a lot of what we're talking about is very logical. It's like looking at these things categorically. And, and the truth is the, the appropriate response to this idea is to be filled with awe. I talked about this before, but sometimes the appropriate way to live as a Jesus follower is just to stop and reflect on the truth of what God has done for you and the necessity of it that it's not like Jesus was just another option thrown onto the table that, oh yeah, if, if you want to, to be right with God, you can, you can do this, 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 or if you want to put your faith in Jesus, you can do that too. They're all pretty good options. No, 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 Jesus is, he's it. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And without Jesus being, being given to us, we would have no hope. We would have no, no hope of being able to stand before God, this holy, righteous, just God, and believe that we have any leg to stand on. But now God, <coughs> but now God, <coughs> everyone's gonna think I have coronavirus because I'm coughing. It's not halfway through the message. I swallowed something, something weird. I don't know. But now God, he's given us everything we need to know him. So that, that's beautiful, good news. And it should fill you with awe. It should fill you with wonder. And if you're filled with awe, if you're filled with wonder and you just live your life saying, God, I'm amazed by what you've done. How, how, can I, how can I live in response to that? What, what can I do to, to thank you for that? If that's just the, the posture of your heart, then you're in the right place. And what he's gonna tell you most, most of the time is just love other people. Give that same love and grace to others. And that pleases him very much. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for, God, thank you so much for the grace that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that even though, yes, your wrath is real, and yes, you are a just God, and you're a God who opposes evil. And by the way, thank you, Lord, for opposing evil, because if you didn't oppose evil, that would be indifference. And indifference is the opposite of love. Indifference is the opposite of love, Lord, and you are not indifferent. Thank you, God, that you you deal with those things. And Lord, thank you that because of Jesus, we don't have to worry about, about what that means for us that we can simultaneously admit that we have issues, that we have sin, that yes, Lord, we even have darkness and evil inside of us and it's, it's manifested itself in many different ways, but now you have freed us and given us a way out. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. Help us live a life where we are, we are filled with the, the kind of awe and thankfulness that we should have in our hearts because of what you've done. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus, amen. Hey guys, before we wrap up, I wanna finish with Lord's Supper. (coughs) I'm excited to have something to drink. (coughs) All right, this bread, it represents, it's great when it's live, by the way, and you're coughing the whole time. Um, This bread represents Jesus's body, broken for us on the cross. 
And, and, and this, is, this is our hope, guys. This is our salvation. It's this sacrifice that, that makes this whole but now God thing real. But now God has provided a way for us to be made right with him. And it's through the payment that Jesus already gave on the cross. And when we take this in, we, we thank him for that. And so grab some bread, some juice, if you have it available. Um, let's take this together. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this piece of bread and what it represents. Your body broken for us on the cross. And Lord, I pray in your name. In your name right now, Lord, I pray. That as we take this piece of bread in, or even Lord, if we don't have bread and juice, you know, those of us watching that don't have that available, that as we think about this, Lord, we would truly be filled with gratitude for what you've done. We love you, Lord. Let's take the bread. Let's pray for the juice. Lord, thank you for this juice and what it represents. Your blood spilled on the cross for us. You gave everything. You, you paid a, a heavy price, the, the heaviest price that could be paid for our freedom. And now we can say that, that but now, we've been, we've been given away to be made right with you, Lord, not by our own actions, but by what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for this. It's in your name we pray, amen.